Praise the Lord, Rock Church, and good morning to all of you, and welcome to the Rock Church in Clute, Texas, 540 South Main. Welcome to all of you today, and pardon my technical difficulties at the moment, but I'm trying to give you the full experience of the roaring fire in the background. You can barely see that, and my head is kind of cut off too. Anyway, I just wanted to drop in for just a few minutes this morning and wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Good, cool, chilly Christmas morning. Nothing like cold weather on Christmas day. Here in South Texas, you never know what you're gonna get. We could be getting um, 75 degrees and rain or as we got a few years ago, we got several inches of snow on Christmas day. I think that was 2004, 2005. But here we are on this Christmas morning, beautiful blue skies here in beautiful South Texas. So welcome to all of you this morning. It's great to be with you. I just wanted to check in for a few minutes and just remember why we celebrate this time of the year. It's very special time of the year. It's a very important time for us to remember why we celebrate. It's not that Christ was actually born in December. We don't even really know the month or the year that he was, or the month, the time of the year that he was born. The fact is that he came. He came to us in our greatest hour of need. He came into this world to save sinners. And we are thankful to the Lord for that. Amen. And so today, I just, again, I wanted to check in for a few moments. I do want to take a minute or two and share with you some things from the scriptures. And um, my iPad, please. And so I, I wanted to go with you, go to the word of the Lord. I want to go to the book of Luke here in just a second. I'm going to give a few more people time to join in with us. I know it's Christmas morning. People are busy and it's quite all right. Um, call it a lack of faith if you want, but I knew that people would be busy this morning. But I didn't want to let this day go by without tagging in and talking about the Christ and his coming. At our Christmas Eve service last night, we talked about this as well. And it is something to pay attention to. The birth of Christ is that significant event in history that forever sealed the deal for us. We are not Jews. Most of us here in this part of the world, there are, there are a number of, of Jews here in the United States. But by and large, this is a Gentile nation. This is a non-Jewish nation. And so... We are not Jews, and therefore our lineage does not lend us to being able to participate with the law of Moses. If, we, if Christ had not come, then we would have been outsiders. We would have been left out. But when God came into this world in the form of a Savior, when God became flesh and dwelt among us, he came to us in our greatest hour of need as sinners prepared a way for us to have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And by doing so, he forever opened a door, a door. Jesus Christ said he was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the way to God. He was the truth about God, and he was the very life itself that he was going to put inside of us. Without him, we do not have eternal life. We live under the fear of death constantly, but now as sons of God, born again of water and spirit, we have been given eternal life. So now that my soul has this gift living inside, I now have the benefit that if I die today, my soul will go to its eternal abode with my Father in heaven. That, my friends, is the gift of the Holy Ghost. We've talked about this a number of times, but I want to mention it again today. We have a great gift 
this baptism of the Holy Ghost, this new birth experience, the, you know, the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now we also participate in that through um, Christ, um, his death, burial, and resurrection. But we now experience it through repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. For us, it's death at repentance, it's burial at baptism, it's rising at the resurrection with newness of life being filled with the Spirit. And that prepares us then for that final resurrection when Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the confidence that we share today as as recipients of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yes, yes, today we celebrate the wonderful gift that God has given to us. So I just want to take a moment here. We're going to go to the book of Luke chapter 1, and we'll read from Matthew chapter 1 as well. But I just want to share a portion of the story. Bishop mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, talking about how we should do this on Christmas morning before you open gifts, read it so that your children understand. I mentioned it last night, but this is something that my wife and I have been have been faithful to do for many years. Uh, When the boys were little, when they were old enough to understand what was going on, it was difficult for them to sit still, knowing that they had a bunch of gifts under the tree but we wanted them to understand the value and the significance of what we celebrate. Because ladies and gentlemen, if we do not value it, the next generation will not value it at all. So today we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ by putting up a Christmas tree, buying gifts. And I realize that many of the things we do at Christmas time have really nothing to do with the Christ child. The gifts under the tree, they refer back to the gifts that the wise men brought, gold and frankincense and myrrh. But now throughout the years, Christmas has become very commercialized, Good, uh, not Good Friday, but Black Friday, and then Cyber Monday, and then Giving Tuesday. Uh, this whole season is built around money and corporations making lots of money by us spending lots of money, running up credit card bills that we can't afford to pay down the road. And yeah, all of those things are part of this season. But none of that really ties in. Again, the gifts under the tree, something, a little bit of something about that. But really and truly, the world has, met by and large, just skipped over the true meaning of Christmas. The word Christmas if you took it apart, it would be Christ Mass. It would be a um, it would be about the advent or the coming of Christ into this world through the Virgin Mary. That's really what it's about: God in flesh, reconciling the world unto Himself. That's truly what Christmas is. And so, because of this, we have a time to celebrate. Again, it's not December. That's really not the time when Christ was born, but somewhere the calendar came to be set at December 25th that we would celebrate Christmas Day and all of the other, you know, Easter. We don't even really know when the resurrection was, as it were. But that's usually in the spring because of the resurrection. Again, dates and times do not necessarily matter. What matters is, is that we remember why we do what we do. And so this morning, I just wanted to touch in with a, for a few moments here. So I want to read to you from the book of Luke, chapter 1. I read this last night, but I'm going to go just a little bit farther with it today. Uh, you're welcome to come and go anytime you need to, but this will be recorded and put out there for, for you to watch later if you would like. But again, I just... I, it wasn't me, the Lord... Um, made it clear to me that we would not let this day skip it and not do anything. No, we're not meeting in person today. We met in person last night. We had a good group that came and we, 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 we talked about the Lord's birth. We, we sang 
And then we fellowshiped and broke bread together. It was a great time. There was laughter. There was lots of chatter and talk and fellowship. It was very good. But even though we're not meeting in person today, yet we are still celebrating together, maybe miles and miles apart, but we're still celebrating together what this season means. So if you'll go with me to the book of Luke, I'm going to begin reading at verse 26, and I'm going to read down to um, verse 38. So 26 to 38. So would you follow along with me as I read? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, I could go back and we could spend a considerable amount of time talking about the prophetic utterances that came through the prophets of old. Isaiah was one of the major ones in Isaiah 7, 14, and then Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. And then you could even go all the way out to, I believe it was Zechariah who talked about the Messiah would come riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And then there were other prophetic utterances throughout the ages. Even the psalmist had some things to say about the Christ. But it was the, the one thing that we need to remember is that it was promised to King David. God spoke to him when he was trying, he, wanting to, he wanted to build a temple. And the Lord told him, no, I'm not going to let you build me a temple. But he said, this is what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to let a man from your lineage sit up on the throne of Jerusalem forever. David at the time probably didn't completely understand this. What God was saying to him is that there would come a day when there would be a man of the line of David who would sit up on the throne of Jerusalem forever. But we now know that this Jerusalem is not only mentioning Jerusalem in the land of Israel, which Christ will sit on the throne in Jerusalem and he will reign there on that throne for a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years, it will be that last great battle of Gog and Magog. Then we will all go to the new Jerusalem, which is in heaven, that new heaven, that new earth, and that where John saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. That's us. That will be later. And then, then the Lord will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will sit on the throne forever. Yes, there's a lot to be said here. I'm not, I, I didn't intend to take a lot of time with this, but just so that you know, and whoever's watching now or in the future will understand that this Christ that we serve, this Christ who was born in a manger, he came through the womb of a virgin, was born in the lowly stable with animals around perhaps. It was probably a barn or maybe even a cave type situation. But this is where the king of the ages was born into. Unknown by the world around them until the shepherds on the hillside heard the angel choir singing and they go to Bethlehem and see the child. And then they spread the news that Christ is born. And then the wise men come and then the story begins to take on a life of itself throughout the life of Christ. But this, this is the hope of mankind coming into the world in a very lowly way of, of entering the world through the womb of a virgin, which again, that was um, an unwed mother. She, she became pregnant before her and Joseph were actually wed. And so all of the, the circumstances that surround this birth completely take it out of the norm what you would think would happen for a king. And it was done this way on purpose. It's significant. Every part of the story is significant and points to God and his sovereignty, his ability to do whatever it is he chooses to do in whatever way he chooses to do it. God is not conventional. Let me just say that again, God is not conventional. He doesn't follow any convention other than his own. 
And we have his word, the Bible, those 66 books. That's the, God's convention. That's the way God works, the way his word states it. But before there was a Bible, God was writing his convention long before there was, it was even written down. So here we are today with the greatest opportunity in all of the world to celebrate our relationship with the Father. And it's only because of the Christ. Amen. Verse 27. I promise I won't do this for every verse, but I just wanted to make this point about David in verse 27. Now let's read verse 28. And the angel came in unto her. This is Luke 1, 28 through 38. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and she cast in her mind what manner of salutation this, this should be. What is he saying to me? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, This is important. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. God is a spirit. And he is a Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. And that spirit, God himself, overshadowed Mary. She conceived and bore a child. Therefore, the Father, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is none other than God himself. He overshadowed Mary. She conceived and she bore a child. And the angel said, that thing which shall be born of thee, that holy thing shall be called the Son of God. If that's not plain enough, then I trust that the Holy Ghost himself will open your eyes and let you see that God is the Father. The Holy Ghost is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one God, one Spirit, and that God, that Spirit, was the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, Matthew chapter 1. And we will begin reading at verse number 18. And we will read to the end of the chapter, which is verse 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And again, I apologize for the view. I was trying to get um, the um, raging, roaring fire in the background, the beautiful Christmas tree. Uh, I, I hope that you can see it. 25. Matthew 1, verse 18. Now, this is, this is Joseph's side of the story. Luke 2 or Luke 1 was where we read Mary's side. This is when Joseph gets his part of the story. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, 
thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I'm going to read you something here in just a minute that my cousin wrote. I shared it last night, but I want to read it to you again for those of you who were not there. But those three words mean everything to us. We could go to the book of 2 Corinthians and we could read chapter 5 where it speaks of the fact that, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That is saying to us, more than we can fully grasp or comprehend in this life. What it is saying to us is that before Christ came, our sinfulness that we got from Adam was keeping us from any kind of close fellowship with the Father. When Adam sinned in the garden, God separated himself from mankind. There was a gulf that was fixed between God and man because of the sin in man God could not deal with that one-on-one. -on -one. He couldn't fellowship with that, rather. He dealt with sin with judgment throughout the Old Testament. And there is still a judgment yet to come. But because the Christ has come, God was in Christ. And through the Christ, he was reconciling sinful man back to himself. That, my friends, is everything to us. Let's, let's consider it just for a moment that our sinfulness brought on death. The wages of sin, the Bible tells us, is death. It's separation from God. And all through the Old Testament, you can go back and you read through the book of Hebrews, where, where the writer to the Hebrews is telling them, he's telling those new believers, he says, now because of Christ's coming, you now have the spirit of life living inside of you. No longer do you have to fear death. Under the law of Moses, there was always the fear of judgment and of death. But now the love of God has been manifested to us and that love of God cast out fear because there is no fear in love. And, and if we have fear, it's because we're fearful of the judgment. That's what John said. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he, he took upon himself our sin, he died, he was buried, he rose again. And in that, he paid the ultimate penalty. And now you and I, being born again of water and spirit, no longer have to pay that penalty. He paid it for us, and now we bear his life in us. No. This body we live in today will not ever walk on streets of gold. This body is going to be left behind. This mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruption is going to put on incorruption. Then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. That's what we have to look forward to because the Christ came. Yes, I know it's Christmas, and I know this, is, this message is kind of taking the long way around today. But the Lord is simply trying to once again reiterate to us his desire for reconciliation. Not only did he reconcile us, but he gave us not only the, the, um, the he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, and then he gave us the word of reconciliation. So those of us who are born again, we have been given the ministry of Christ to reconcile God unto himself. Think about it. Christ Jesus, the man Christ Jesus is not here, but you and me have been given the same ministry 
to reconcile the world unto the Father. No, we don't save them, but we represent the gospel. We represent salvation to this world through what Christ has already done for us. Amen. Matthew 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he, Joseph, called his name Jesus. Now, this is what I copied and pasted out of Facebook. My cousin, Greg Starks, posted this. And he quotes Matthew 1, 22 and 23, which I just read. And then he says this, three simple words, God with us. But those words change everything. Never let anything not the busyness of the season, not familiarity with the story, not cynicism about the current age, not the difficulties of life, not unpleasant circumstances, not even the very real losses of this life. He says, never let any of those things steal the awe and wonder at what is celebrated in this season. God with us changes everything, end of quote. So here we are. We are recipients of the greatest gift that's ever been given. Christ Jesus is a gift to this world. And then he gave us, through his death, burial, and res resurrection, the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of everlasting life. And then there were other, other gifts that were given. We won't, I won't get into all of that today, but this gift that we have is meant to be shared. It's not just for us. It's not just to get us from earth to glory. That's part of it. But my life in Christ is now, is now given to me to serve him, to serve his kingdom, to serve the Lord for the sake of the souls of men that are still lost in this world. If we live beyond our new, new birth experience, then we are called to serve. If you came out of the water speaking with other tongues and immediately died of a heart attack, that would have been the end of it. That would have been your saving grace. That would have been everything. But if we live beyond that day, then God is actively saving us. God is actively working in us. And therefore, he is, act, he, is, he is actually expecting us to actively participate with him in his kingdom. His work is unending in us until the day he returns for us. Therefore, our work is unending until he returns. So today, I just, as the Lord had, had spoke, I wanted to come and, and just take a few moments here. It's only been about a half an hour and I'm going to stop. But I, I want us to remember what it truly means to be a child of God, what it truly means to serve the Lord, to serve who he is and to serve what he is, to serve um, his kingdom in that in that to go out into the world and reach those who have never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a quote um, that my wife just showed me, and I'm going to share this. It's by Brent Carr. He is an evangelist. And this is what he said. He's speaking of Mary. He says she was highly favored, but was almost put away by the man she loved the most. She was highly favored, but she was rejected by every person in Bethlehem. Highly favored, but she laid on the dirt floor of a barn and gave birth to a baby she carried nine months. 
highly favored, but in the middle of the night had to leave all she knew and move to a strange town because God said so. Favor never looks like favor at first. Favor sometimes takes you through frustration, failure, and fear. You want to be favored of God? It may be in darkest night or deepest valley, but they're in that place where no one sees you and you feel like no one understands. Whisper to yourself, this is only the beginning, not the end. This will turn out for my good and his glory. This is because I am favored. And today that is truly the fact. We have been called and chosen by God. In matter of fact, the, new, the King James Version uses the word elected. He called us, he chose us. And then when he filled us with his spirit, that was his election. That was God putting his stamp of approval on us and say, I have chosen you and now I have elected you and I've gave you my seal, that seal of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the Lord knows them that are his because they have received that seal, his stamp of approval. So the rest of our lives are spent living to hear him say on that last day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of heaven. I believe that's, that, that is everyone's desire. And I pray this for you today in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me pray and then we will go on about our Christmas Day celebrations with family and friends and lots of good food, I'm sure. And so uh, if you would join with me, let me pray here for just a moment. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the power and the privilege of prayer. By this avenue, you've given us the ability to come boldly to the throne of grace and when we walk right up to your throne, we can make our petitions known. We can fellowship with you just like we would our neighbor. God, it's not that we always are, are badgering you or lamenting our state before you. And there are times, Lord, we will do that. But I believe today is a day of celebration and praise, a time for us to come into your presence where we're not asking you for anything where we're just simply reminded of your goodness and your grace towards us. The love of God that was manifest in the Christ. That love of God was demonstrated to the entire world when Christ hung on the tree. Lord, need we ask for anything when everything has already been given to us? I say, nay, nay, but today, Lord, we celebrate and we rejoice and we worship the goodness of God, and we celebrate the love and the mercy, the compassion, the long suffering of the Savior. Lord, I don't need anything else. I don't need any other material things, Father. I have everything that you've already given to me. So today, oh Lord, I'm not here to ask you for anything. I have life and breath. There's food on our table, shoes on our feet, clothes on our backs, a roof over our head. And Father, there's good cars to drive and many changes of clothes in the closet. So today, Lord, I don't need anything. I just simply need to worship you and to magnify and to bless you for who you are and what you are. And so today, oh Lord, I pray that we can do this as a church family, the Rock Church in Clute, Texas. I pray that we can do this, Lord, as the Rock Church in Beaverton and in, in North Carolina. Father, I, I pray that we can do this together as a body of believers today. And those who will watch elsewhere in other times and places, Father, I pray that they too will join in. God, the spirit of this message will not change because it's recorded. It's not live then. The, the, the spirit of the Lord will go with this message, Lord, whenever it's watched or wherever it's watched the times and places are no matter to this, Lord. It's your presence. It's your eternal spirit that will go with it wherever it goes. And I pray, oh Lord, that there would be a joining together, a oneness, whenever it's watched, that their spirit will connect with our spirit and we will rejoice together in who you are and what you are. God, we celebrate your coming. 
Thank you for the Christ child. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you became our, our go-between. You became our savior. You became our, our, our comforter. And I praise you and I thank you. And God, I speak blessings upon your people. I lose faith. God, through your grace, that faith and love that super abounded towards us. Thank you. We praise you and we bless you. And until we are able to gather together again on uh, next Saturday night for our New Year's Eve service, Father, we worship you and we praise your holy name. Thank you. Thank you for your good and precious gift to us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And I wish you all a very Merry Christmas from my wife and I, from, from mom. We wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I pray that you're able to be with family and friends, to be with someone close by that you love dearly. Join with them. Let's celebrate together of the good things of God. Amen. And again, Merry Christmas. Looking forward to being with you all next Saturday night for our New Year's Eve service. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen.